Amen. All right. Let's open our Bibles, if you have them, to Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. Well, we left off last week with with Jesus uh, saying to the Pharisees, essentially, hey, you guys want a sign? I'll give you a sign, and here it is. And he said, remember Jonah? <laughs> and, and he um, basically says, you know, Jonah was, was three days in the belly of a fish, and then he was brought back to life, so to speak, and, and I'm going to die, and I'm going to come back to life, and that's going to be my sign. That's, that's how we ended last week. So let's pray. Lord, as we open your word, speak to our hearts, Lord. Soften our hearts. Speak to us directly, Lord. We, we call upon you in Jesus' name. Amen. So Jesus says this, and you know, I think that as we grow in our faith, <clears throat> as you mature in your faith, you don't need signs as much. You know, maybe when you first became a Christian, first walking with the Lord, Maybe you, you prayed that, Lord, show me, give me a sign. I want to know about this. But as we trust in the Lord, as we walk with him, the less we need those signs. The more we believe his word, the less we need those types of signs. And, and Jesus, he gives them this message and says, this is the sign, the resurrection, essentially. This is going to be the sign. And then he turns and walks away. Look at Mark chapter 8. Look at verse 13. And he says, he left them, and getting into the boat again, departed to the other side. You know, he didn't say, hey, thank you very much. It's been really nice talking to you guys. Um, he says, hey, you guys, you want a sign? No sign's going to be given to you <laughs> until, until the resurrection. And then he just walks off. <laughs> and I think this is so cool, because I've wanted to do this so many times to people. <clears throat> I did it once. <laughs> but isn't that neat? I mean, he doesn't he waste his time. He says, guys, no sign's going to be given and just walks away and gets in the boat with his disciples. Look at verse 14. It continues. It says, now the disciples had forgotten to take bread and they did not have more than one loaf with them in the boat. <clears throat> this is clearly... <laughs> a cause for concern for the disciples. Oh my gosh, we forgot the bread. <laughs> Maybe they're hungry, is what I kind of imagine. But they're certainly concerned about this. And, and I find this interesting because they shouldn't have been concerned. I mean, they were with the one who just miraculously, you know, turned bread uh, and fish into meals for thousands of thousands of people. They've watched Jesus do this. And they're with Jesus. You know, so they, they, it shouldn't have been a problem to them. But they're hungry, and it's a cause of concern here. And so in, in verse 15, it says, Then he charged them, saying, Jesus says, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the leaven of Herod. And so Jesus, he's thinking about this encounter he had with the Pharisees. And he decides... As the disciples say, hey, we're hungry and we, we forgot the bread. We only have one loaf here. He decides to use this as a teachable moment. And he says, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. Now, we know that leaven it, it, or, or is the yeast that's placed in the dough. And it causes the dough to rise, right? An interesting thing about yeast and leaven is it only takes a little bit. It only takes a little bit of Leaven, a little bit of yeast, and, and it affects the entire loaf. And leaven is always seen in the Bible as, as a picture of sin. It's seen as a picture of evil. And so, a little bit of sin, we might say a little bit of compromise, it affects all of us. It affects our, our, entire, our entire life, and it spreads. A little bit of leaven, a little bit of yeast, to maybe make it, a little more understandable. I mean, can you imagine if I made you some brownies, but I just put a little bit of dog poop in it? <laughs> you know? It would ruin the whole thing, right? <laughs> and, and, and it's, but that's the image. 
that Jesus is, is, is saying. That's the image that Jesus is warning the disciples. He's warning them about this leaven of the Pharisees. You know, the leaven of the Pharisees that, uh, was essentially legalism. I mean, they judged their spirituality by, the, by their outward appearance, by their works, by their rituals, by their rules, by, 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 by the rituals that they did. And so on the outside, they looked pretty good. They looked pretty good, but on the inside, they, we know they were hypocritical. We know their heart was far from God, and that's what God looks at is our heart. He looks at our heart. They had this dead religion. They didn't have this relationship. And, and, and you know, anyone today can be affected by legalism. You know, the, the leaven of legalism, it, it, it produces a pride because it basically that's the Pharisees. They thought they're better than everybody else. Look what we do. Look how spiritual we are. And, and when, when we begin to compare ourselves to others, we can act the same way. Look how, look how great I am. Look how, how spiritual I am. And we can easily say, look at the, these people, they're not living up to my standard, you see. And, and, and in that place, we can easily start looking down upon others. But pride, I think, is that the top of the list of really the seven sins, as it says in Proverbs 6, it, it says it's abomination to the Lord. You know, spiritual pride, I think, may be the worst Spiritual pride. And so Jesus, he says, beware of the leaven of legalism, of the Pharisees. You know, also, he says, of Herod, the leaven of Herod. And what would be the leaven of Herod? I think we might be able to call it liberalism. I mean, uh, you know, it, it, Herod was, it, you know, it, it was compromised. He was very compromised and liberal things, you know, and I think we, we live in a day and age where compromise, where liberalism has entered the church. We have woke pastors, woke churches. They allow almost anything and everything in their church. They're, you know, they, they, they essentially throw out the word of God, you know, and, and we have, a, you know, they, they've allowed, I mean, that's a whole other sermon, I'll just say. <laughs> you know, but we know this. This is happening in our day and age, the church age that we live in right now. We, we have this, this entering the church. So we have this legalism. We have this liberalism, this compromise. You know, again, with the, with the Pharisees, though, they, they, they had these rules. They had these, they, you know, the, the, these regulations. And they taught if you didn't follow those rules, if you didn't follow those, those things, you were not pleasing God. And of course, Jesus himself violated their rules. He never violated the word of God, though. He violated, he violated the rules made by man. And they accused him of violating the Sabbath, which he never did. But this, see, this is a typical, you know, legalistic approach. This is a, of, of people. They, they major in the minors, and they're always nitpicking and finding sin in others, without de dealing with their sin. And legalistic people are quick to jump to conclusions, you know, or make snap judgments. And we see this. There's no grace. There's just hypocritical judgment, legalism. And we have to guard ourselves against this. You know, in the mind of a legalist, you're guilty until proven innocent. You know, they, they, they believe the worst instead of the best. And so we have these two things. We have legalism and we have liberalism. How about neither, right? <laughs> we don't want either one of these. We don't want to allow compromise. But we also, we want to live for the Lord, but we don't want to be legalistic. And so I think, if you think about this, we need to be careful that, that we avoid anything that brings us down spiritually. Certainly right? But we also, we need to show a lot of grace and a lot of love. Any kind of leaven working way into your life, you know, I think one of the, the things that we get do away with it, we just have to deal with it quickly. I mean, that's the answer. It, it's just, it, 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 that leaven, it spreads so fast. Compromise, any kind of compromise spreads fast. And, you know, maybe it'd be easier to change analogies. I mean, something like cancer, 
I mean, we think about cancer, and, and, and the key, they say, is early detection. If you ca- catch it early, the chances of your survival are much greater, right? And they say, early detection is the key. The same, that's the same with sin. You know, if you, if, you, if you catch it early, if you deal with it quickly, that's what the Lord wants. He wants us to deal with our sin quickly. You know, in Matthew's gospel, it actually adds, Jesus warned one more thing about leaven. He says the leaven of the Sadducees. You know, the Sadducees were the other religious group in Israel. And the Sadducees, they didn't believe in miracles. Uh, They didn't believe in the afterlife. And you see, that's sad, you see. No. (laughs) See, they believed in the here and now. And essentially what their leaven was, was materialism because they judged their spirituality on outward wealth. And they would say things like, well, look at God's blessed me. I must be spiritual. Look how much I have. Right? And they're the ones that were in charge of the swap meets in the temple and the courtyard and they were making money like a business. And essentially they took advantage of people in the name of religion. All because they weren't focused on God, but on materialism. And again, we as believers that we can fall into the same trap. We can fall in that trap if our whole focus is on stuff and, and things of this world instead of the, th- the world to come. And, and so we can judge our spiritual blessing too. I, I've seen a lot of people do this, what, how much we've acquired or look at, the Lord's blessed us. <laughs> We have to be careful. Remember, Jesus, he, he's already told us in the, in the book of Mark, he's told us that riches can be a distraction because it gets our heart off what's really important. You know, I was reading this story about uh, a, a pastor. He was having dinner with this wealthy man from Boston. And this, this man, he was so wealthy. It was this extremely wealthy family uh, from Boston. And, and the pastor asked him, He said this, how in the world did you grow up in the midst of such wealth and not be consumed by materialism? Isn't that a great question? And uh, the, the, the man answered this pastor and he said this, my parents taught us that everything in our home was either an idol or a tool. And I think, isn't that great advice? <laughs> isn't that true? I mean, everything we have can either be an idol or a tool. And the Lord wants, you know, how do we view our possessions? Do we view it as an idol or a tool? You know, possessions are fine as long as they don't possess us. And so Jesus, again, he uses this moment to teach his disciples, watch out for leaven. (laughs) Because it, it goes, spreads fast. And it affects everything. And guess what? The disciples completely missed it. (laughs) It went right over their heads. Because look at verse 16. And they reasoned among themselves saying, is it because we have no bread? (laughs) Is it because we forgot to bring the bread? (laughs) Is Jesus saying this to us? And so Jesus, he uses this moment he launches into this series of questions. There's nine in all. And it's pretty interesting. I'm, gonna, I'm going to read this next section, and I'm going to count the questions, that, the number of questions that Jesus asks, and you'll kind of get the idea uh, of what's happening here. But verse 17, it begins, and Jesus, being aware of it, said to them, number one, why do you reason because you have no bread? Number two, do you not perceive nor understand Number three, is your heart still hardened? Number four, verse 18, having eyes and do not see. Number five, having ears and do not hear. Number six, and do you not remember? Number seven, verse 19, when I broke the five loaves and the 5,000, how many baskets full of fragments did you take up? And they said to him, 12. Number eight, verse 20. Also, when I broke the seven and the 4,000, how many large baskets of full of fragments did you take up? And they said, seven. And so he said to them, number nine, last question, how is it that you do not understand? 
I love these questions that he asked them. <laughs> Jesus makes it clear right here that there's a correlation between the hardening of our hearts and failing memory. I mean, our lack of understanding is connected to our spiritual perception. It's directly connected to our failing memory. I mean, what do I mean by failing memory? Well, forgetting who Jesus is, do we, don't we do this sometimes? We forget who Jesus is. We forget what he's done. We forget how many times he's come through for us. We saw this, we see this problem with the children of Israel. God performed miracle after miracle after miracle. And their unbelief was connected to the hardness of their heart. They forgot what the Lord had done. And every time they found themselves in a jam, what did they do? They only saw the problem right in front of them. And I, I think that we too do the same thing. We too forget all the times the Lord has come through for us. They, they failed, to, you know, Israel failed to see the hand of God that was with them and, and just all the miracles that happened. And, and they, you know, they got to the promised land and what did they say? Oh, there's giants in the land. God brought us here to kill us by the giants. You know, after all the miracles they saw. <laughs> Again, the same thing can happen in our lives. You know, when, when our heart becomes hardened towards the Lord, or when my heart begins to lack that, that fire of faith, or when I forget the faithfulness of God in my own life. We can do this, can't we? I mean, God has, has, done, has blessed us in so many ways, and, and yet these questions that Jesus asked the disciples, I think he might be asking us this morning. You know, the Bible, as I mentioned last week a little bit, it, it describes the heart in three main descriptions. Number one, it, it talks about a dead heart. You know, uh, number two, it talks about a hard heart or, or a cold heart. You know, the, it says in the later times, in the end times, the love of many is going to go cold. And we see that happening, I think, in our day and age. And then the third heart that he talks about is a burning heart or a passionate heart, we might say. The, the same language in verse 18, if you look at that, it says, having eyes and do not see, having ears and do not hear. And do you not remember? <laughs> Don't you remember, guys? <laughs> the 4,000 people we just fed? <laughs> the same words that Jeremiah used to describe the wicked, to describe the ba backslidden people of Judah that he was trying to reach. In Jeremiah 5, uh, 21, it says, Hear now this, O foolish people, without understanding, which have eyes and, not, and see not and have ears and hear not. You know, when you're backslidden, you're, you're dull of hearing. You're dull of hearing. And you're, you know, when you're dull of hearing, you're insensitive to the things of God. The, the things that he wants you to pay attention to. You just, it just kind of, you don't maybe think about it. You know, in re religious rituals without meaning, it makes people dull of hearing. If you're just going through the motions. See, I think this, I don't think God wants us to be religious. He wants you to know him. He wants you to, to walk with him. He, he wants to commune with you. He wants you to, to, to reach out to him and, and you share your heart, you pour, pour your heart out to him, and guess what? He wants to speak to, back to you and minister to you. It's a relationship. That's what he wants. He doesn't want you to have religion. He wants to have a personal relationship with you. God wants us to go deeper with him. You know, if you've been walking with the Lord for a long time, he wants you to go deeper. He's brought you to this point so you can go deeper, so you can know him more. He wants you to know him. Well, the text continues, verse 21. And it says, Then he came to Bethsaida, and they brought 
a blind man to him and begged him to touch him. So he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands on him, he asked him if he saw anything. And he looked up and said, I see men like trees walking. And then he put his hands on his eyes again and made him look up. And he was restored and saw everyone clearly. You know, this is one of the only records of an incomplete cure. You know, you know, the man wasn't healed immediately, if you notice. And it's interesting how this miracle kind of follows the, the events back in the boat with the disciples, where Jesus had some pretty tough words for the disciples. You know, again, they were kind of clueless about the really important things that were going on around them. Because look at back at verse 21. He just says this. He says, how is it you don't understand? And, then, you know, he says, you have eyes, but you're not seeing. And then he heals this man and, and his eyes, and he, he's not seeing clearly. <laughs> I think there's a direct co- correlation here. Because this idea of seeing in, in, the, in the Bible, it, it goes along with understanding. In the Greek word, for, the word for seeing is also translated understanding. We understand that, right? We, do, do you see? Do you understand? Uh, you know, we use that too. And I, I wonder if there isn't a lesson here about Jesus how to help us grow in our understanding as he wants us to see. You know, if you think about it, when we first come to Jesus, he, he does a work in our life, and our heart, but sometimes we don't see everything clearly because we just don't know. You know, it's like we, we're just learning and, and we still are kind of doing this or that and, 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 um, but then he, he, he comes into our life and he, and he helps us just as we go along, as we walk with him more and more and more, he helps us see things more clearly. He helps us understand things more clearly. As we read the word, we, we grow and we learn. And, you know, when, when we first come to the Christ, the Holy Spirit comes in and, and he fills us up. But then there's other times, you know, the Bible says be con- continually filled with the Spirit or empowered with the Spirit. And there's times where we need that empowering of the Spirit in our lives. And so he does, and we see things more even clearer then. This man, this blind man, notice he isn't rebuked by Jesus for his lack of faith. He just simply asks if he sees anything. He's like, well, I see I see." people walking around. I see men walking around, but they look like trees to me. I just, it's not clear. And Jesus, he's not finished with him. And so until this man sees people for what they really are, he's like, oh, I can, I, yeah, I can see now. They're, I can see clearly. And then verse 26 continues, and he's, he sent him away to his house saying, neither go into the town nor tell anyone in the town. Now Jesus and his disciples went out of the town of Caesarea Philippi, and on the road he asked his disciples, saying to them, Who do men say that I am? It's a good question that Jesus asks. You know, if you think about it, these are Jesus and his disciples. Do you know what a disciple is? The, the translation, the, the, the simple term is a student learner. That's the definition, a student learner. So these student learners, they're learning. And for being a disciple of Christ, is not just learning about him, but it's doing what God says. And I think this sometimes is the hardest thing for people. They know about him, but now they have to do what he says, and that's a lot harder. And so, who do men say I am? Verse 27, verse 28. So they answered, John, John the Baptist, but some say Elijah, others, and others, one of the prophets. But he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said to him, you are the Christ. And then he strictly warned them that they should tell no one about him. See, Jesus asked them another important question. <laughs> who do men say that I am. 
And they go on and they say, well, you know, the disciples say, well, some are, people are saying you're John the Baptist. Some people are saying you're Elijah or, you know, some prophet. And just like today, if you were to go to some mall and you were to go around and you were to ask people, who do men say that, you know, who's Jesus? You would get a lot of different answers, wouldn't you? Some people might say, well, he was a good teacher. Some might say he was a prophet. Some might even say he was a phony. Others might say he was a good example. Some might say, well, he's, he, he's my cousin who makes good tacos. Jesus. No, I'm joking. <clears throat> you would get a wide variety of answers, wouldn't you? Of who Jesus is. And there, in Jesus' day, the same was true. There was a wide variety of, of who is this Jesus? But then Peter pipes up here and he says, you are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. You, you are the one we've been waiting for, the king of the Jews. See, we have to understand why Jesus is asking this question. If any of us were to ask that question, well, who, who people are, people, what are people saying about me, you know? It might sound kind of arrogant. You know, what are people saying about me on Facebook? Or what are people saying about my message today, right? You know, we, if we were to ask that, it would seem maybe arrogant, but Jesus, he wasn't doing that. He was saying, Jesus was saying this, who, is, who am I to you? Who is Jesus to you? That's the question he's asking all of us this morning. Who is Jesus to you? That's the most important question you could ever answer. Who is Jesus to you? And, 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 and how you answer that reveals who you are. See, before we can truly be a disciple, we have to come to the place where we confess Christ, that he's the Lord of our lives, that he's the one we've been longing for in our hearts. It's not enough just to know what the world thinks about Jesus or, or what Pastor Brian thinks about Jesus, but it comes down to the fact of who do you say that I am? Jesus is asking all of us this morning that same question. Who am I to you? See, we have to confess that he is the Lord. He's not just a good example. He's not just a good teacher. But he's the Lord of our lives. Who do you say that he is? That's where it begins, the confession. Well, you're the Lord of my life. But that's not where discipleship ends. That's just where it begins. See, it's, it's one thing to say with your lips, Jesus, your Lord. It's another thing now to live that out, that he's actually Lord of your life. I think this is such a great text as we come to the communion table this morning because it, it really comes down to the, the, the Lord is asking us, each one of us, to take a heart check. You know, in the Bible, it tells us in Proverbs to guard your heart. Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. It, it, essentially, be careful what you allow into your heart. The leaven. <laughs> be careful. It also it tells us that we need to have a regular heart check. You know, in Psalm 139, it says, Search me, O God, know my heart, try me, and know my anxieties, and see if there's any wicked way in me, and lead me to the way of everlasting. That's, that's what he wants. He wants, he, he knows our heart better than us. He wants to search our heart if we allow him. And it also says in Isaiah, to water your heart, but now, O Lord, you are our father and we are the clay and you are the potter and we are the work of your hands you know the essential ingredient for for a potter working with clay is what water because water uh, 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 as you're molding something you put water it makes it it makes it moldable it makes the clay soft so you can mold it into how you want to shape it and the bible liken, likens the word of god to being like water it refreshes our, our, our soul, our thirst, it, it, what, it's what keeps our heart soft, the word of God. 
and you read the word, and if you're open and receptive to it, if you're open and receptive, it'll keep your heart from getting hard. You know, whenever I counsel people, maybe who are struggling, maybe someone struggling with doubt, a common factor I, I, I see almost every single time is they're just in their lives, is a, it's a lack of devotion. You know, if someone's struggling, a lot of times it's a lack of devotion. And then also, it's a lack of time in the Word. If, if they're honest, and I say, hey, are you in the Word? Are you reading the Word? Are you allowing the Word to soften your heart to speak to you? If they're honest, most of the time, I'm not saying it's always time, but most of the time they'll say, ah, you know what, I'm not really in the Word. Maybe sometimes we, we fall into this trap as Christians. We go through the motions of life, of church, and slowly our heart gets hard. You know, it's, it's it, it, even though they, some people have a lot of Bible knowledge, they, they know a lot about the Bible, but if there isn't a regular washing and soaking and applying the word of God to our lives, the word to our heart, then it gets hard. So, as we come to the communion table, this is great because this is a time we get to commune with God. And I just would in invite anybody who's put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ to come to the communion table. You know, Jesus, on the night before he was crucified, he, he was with his disciples, his student learners, and he, and he took the bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is shed for you. Do this. I, I want you to eat this. I want you to remember what I'm going to do on the cross. I'm going to die for you. And then he took the cup and he said, this is, represents my blood. And this is the new covenant and, and I want you to, to drink this and I want you to remember that I, that, I, that I went to the cross for you to die for your sins. And he says, you know, at communion, we remember that. We remember that Jesus went to the cross. And now he rose again. He conquered death. But guess what? He's coming back again. He's coming back again for us. <laughs> Probably sooner than later. <laughs> and that's what we remember too. And so we invite you to come down and grab a, 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 a cup. It has a cracker on one side and juice on the other. And... Uh, and just come down, go back to your seat, and it's a time just to, for you to be with the Lord. It's just a time for you to be with the Lord. And I would ask you to, to, to answer some of these questions. Think about these, some of these questions and think about where your heart is really at. And, and, and allow the Lord to minister to you this morning. And so partake on your own time and we just open up the communion table to you this morning. So Lord, we thank you so much for this time in your word, Lord, and, and I believe that you want to speak to us in a mighty and powerful way this morning, and, and you are speaking to us, and we want to answer those questions, Lord. Who, who, who are you to us?